Good evening, everybody. It's good to be here this evening and to share with you uh, the so-called human evolution, which uh, has got some real problems with it, and we're going to look at that here this evening. And first of all, we're going to see if it uh, will come up on the screen, and it does. We're hitting 100 right now, so that's good. And uh, we'll look at human evolution now. When I was in school in your age, it was a long, long time ago, and I was very intimidated by the teachers telling me that we had apes and chimpanzees in our ancestry and that we are just highly evolved apes. I didn't know anything else. I was not a Christian at the time, and I did not grow up in a Christian home. And so it wasn't until the Navy, during the Vietnam War, I was on an aircraft carrier, and there were some Christians on, on board the aircraft carrier, very much a minority, but the Lord touched my heart and through those individuals, and I got saved back in, no, I forget the year, but anyway, <laughs> it was a while back. So we'll go ahead and look at human evolution here this evening. And I, what I want to do is I want you to follow along with me because I'm going to hit the general theory of evolution first and just kind of share with you what the evolutionists are saying today in the 21st century. Then we're going to go ahead and look at animals and their origin, more specifically mammals, because apes and chimpanzees and people have mammalian traits. And we're going to look at that, and then finally, and that's all going to be an introduction, then we're going to look at human evolution, so-called. But I think it's very important that we get a foundation of what evolution is saying before we jump into this strange philosophy called human evolution. So this is a 1953 book you see up on the screen there. It's called From Fish to Philosopher. And this individual who wrote it, Homer Smith, was a dyed-in-the-wool atheist and an evolutionist. He was an authority on, on renal function, that is kidneys. And so he wrote this book, From Fish to Philosopher, and he had on the cover there what we call phyletic gradualism. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here this evening, but phyletic gradualism or gradual evolution is a lot of what evolutionists believe today. There's other evolutionists believe in something called punctuated equilibria, but we won't get into that uh, this evening. But what I want to do is quote from a 2020 edition of the Dictionary of Zoology. Dictionary of Zoology, Zoology is a Study of Animals, and here's what the author, uh, the, the editor of this Dictionary of Zoology said. He said that phyletic gradualism, also known, it, well, evolution, also known as phyletic gradualism, states that macroevolution. Do you want an example of macroevolution? Look at the cover of that book. It shows fish-like creatures giving rise to the bamboo uh, ba baboon that you see on, on the top of the diagram there. That's what we call macroevolution, real big changes, not the minor variation that you see with the varieties of dogs and so forth. So when you see the word macroevolution, the prefix macro means really big. Macroevolution is merely the operation of microevolution, very small, malinky, just small which operates gradually and more or less continually over relatively long periods of time. And so that's really the definition of evolution today, and that's how we got here according to the evolutionists. So this is an example of <laughs> phyletic gradualism. It shows a heavy-tailed theropod dinosaur. Well, let's see now. We have some heavy-tailed theropod dinosaurs right here. And it gives rise to what according to the diagram? Chicken, there we go, birds, all right? And so the evolutionists say that these formidable fossils here, the heavy-tailed theropod dinosaurs, through time, through this process called phyletic gradualism, gave rise to birds. Well, anybody know what the smallest bird in the world is? Smallest bird in the world is the bee hummingbird of Cuba. And boy, is that small. The mama hummingbird can make her nest inside a hollowed-out golf ball. That's a small bird. Now, when I look at the, he, uh, the bee hummingbird of Cuba, I don't think of these, okay? I think of that God created birds as 100% birds. See how easy science is? Science is very easy, okay? So birds have always been birds, and dinosaurs have always been dinosaurs, you bet. And so the, <laughs> I had to include that example of phyletic gradualism of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs with a heavy tail. I always emphasize that heavy tail because, you know, you, we've all seen birds with real heavy tails, right? Like that bee hummingbird. Okay, moving right along. 
And, and we've got the, uh, the translation there as well. I've got to remember to include that. Well, what about gradual evolution? I have a textbook in my office in Dallas, and it's uh, edited, it's written by not one, but six evolutionists. So here's what six evolutionists had to say. This phenotypic gradualism was controversial when Darwin first proposed it, and it is still controversial. Now, when was the date? When was this book published? It was published in 2020. <laughs> okay. So that's just last year that that book came out. So these six evolutionists are admitting that phenotypic gradualism was controversial when Darwin suggested it back in the 1850s, and they said, as of the year 2020, it is still controversial. I bet you haven't heard that in your high school or college classes. But remember, when we talk about this strange idea that says that these guys gave, race, gave rise to birds, we have to understand that even the evolutionists are saying it's what? What's the word there? Controversial. It's very controversial. Keep that in mind if you would. And by the way, here's another example of phyletic gradualism as taught by a majority of colleges and universities in the United States and the world. It shows an ape-like creature there at the end of the left-hand side there giving rise to people on the right-hand side. That is called a linear type of process of human evolution. Guess what? Even the evolutionists don't believe that anymore. That went out with the Model T Ford. So nobody <laughs> believes in the slow, gradual evolution from an ape-like creature to a human being. It's simply bad science. And so that's the, uh, the situation as it stands with uh, phyletic gradualism. Let's look at the origin of animals, just general animals. Where did animals come from? And that's a good question to ask because you're going to taxpayer-paid supported colleges, um, uh, junior high and high schools, and that's a valid question to ask. What about the origin of animals? Well, uh, understanding when and where animals evolved has proved very difficult for who? Paleontologists. What is a paleontologist? People who study fossils. People who study the fossils there, like that T-Rex skull and the other fossils that we have displayed throughout the church. The people who study those fossils are called paleontologists. You would think that they would have the answers to the origin of animals, for example, but they have, they're quite candid, and I salute them for their intellectual honesty because they're saying understanding how and when animals evolved <laughs> has proved very difficult. Well, when you're outside of God, when you're outside of Scripture, then of course it's going to be difficult. Of course the evidence is not going to fit this slow and gradual evolutionary process. Why? Because according to the fossil record, and this is what I think you heard as you did the tours, if you went on these uh, tours last Thursday, you understood that these fossils show up suddenly, complete, and fully formed that there is no gradual evolution documented in the sedimentary rock units. So the first time you find dinosaurs, you know what they are? They're dinosaurs. The first time that you find them, there are no evolutionary ancestors of dinosaurs. And so when you find T-Rex, it's always a T-Rex. Because God created dinosaurs as dinosaurs, and he created people as people. Both dinosaurs and people were created on the same day, which is day six. Very good, day six, just thousands of years ago. Well, that's about animals in general, while the origin of mammals, now we're getting specific. The evolutionists are talking about mammals, not reptiles, not birds, not amphibians, mammals. The origin of mammals has proved one set of puzzles. The diversification of mammals is also ripe with questions. And that quote comes from a book that, again, I have in my office in Dallas, and this is written by dyed-in-the-wool evolutionists. These are pure evolutionists, but they are admitting that the origin of mammals is one set of puzzles, and the diversification of mammals is also ripe with question. Just puzzles and questions. Let me ask you students something. Does that sound like the fact of evolution? I mean, I'm serious. Does it sound like the fact of... You should remember this quote. 
where they talk about just puzzles and questions. The next time you are told with a wave of their hand that evolution is a fact. No, it's not. They don't know the rise of animals in general, and specifically with the mammals, it's just puzzles and questions. Well, the origin of the placentia, which is the, a, a specific group of mammals, uh, or we would say the crown group, including modern placental mammals and their ancestors, <laughs> I like this, this is a very diplomatic statement, is a much discussed question. <laughs> That's a fancy way of saying what? They don't know. <laughs> they simply don't know. And so this is a very specific and a very important group of placental mammals, such as you see here in these uh, pictures, and they simply say, and again, I'm not criticizing them, that's not the point, but they are saying it's a much discussed question. Then a year later, uh, Alibi, or a couple of years later, Alibi said in his Dictionary of Zoology, marsupials and placental mammals Here's that key word. Here's a very scientific word. What do you see there? Apparently. <laughs> okay. That doesn't sound like a fact. It sounds like apparently diverged from a common ancestor in the Cretaceous, which is a certain period of time. Two things I'd like you students to uh, think about when you see this quote from the Dictionary of Zoology way back in 2020. This individual is saying apparently. In other words, they really don't know. It just apparently. But secondly, and this is very important, because remember we said that the missing links are missing. The missing links are missing. And so when he says at the end of the statement there, diverged from a common ancestor. But guess what? They don't know what that common ancestor is. That common ancestor, students, listen to me, this common ancestor has never been found. And we would predict on the basis of the creation model they never will find that common ancestor. You know why? The common ancestor presupposes evolution. But if God created in the beginning, then they will never find that common ancestor. Can I make a prediction this evening? I'll go ahead and make a prediction. I'll make a scientific prediction. I predict on the basis of the creation science model that they will never find that common ancestor. So now the, the onus is on the evolutionist to do what? Find that common ancestor. Do everything they can to find that common ancestor, to prove those creationists wrong. Well, I, again, let me predict, they will never find that common ancestor because God created when? In the beginning. In the beginning. God was there in the beginning, and he created everything as we read about in the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, just thousands of years ago. Well, what about the origin of mankind? What about the origin of people? Then now we're getting into what we're supposed to be discussing here tonight as we look at human evolution. Again, let me repeat, we looked at the general idea of the origin of the animals and came up empty according to evolution. Then we looked at the more specific group of anim animals called the mammals which is what the chimpanzees and the monkeys and people belong to and come up empty. Now let's address specifically the origin of mankind. First of all, we'll look at scripture. We'll look at something written by God who was there in the beginning. And we see in Genesis chapter 2, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. So students, what is this saying in Genesis chapter 2? God is telling us that he created man in his own image and that man was not created, did not come up from the apes, that he was created in God's image just thousands of years ago. And so we would not expect to find missing links between animals and people because people and animals are created separately. Think about Genesis chapter 1. How many times do we find in Genesis chapter 1 that God created after their kind? How many times do we see that phrase, after its kind, after their kind? Answer, ten times. Ten times we read in Genesis chapter 1 that God created after their kind. You know what that tells me as a scientist this evening? It tells me that God didn't use evolution. 
<laughs> he didn't use evolution. How do you know that, Dr. Sherwin? Well, it says right there in Scripture, he created after their kind. If he created after their kind, then we should not expect to find missing links. We should not be able to find in the fossil record creatures that led up to dinosaurs because God created dinosaurs as dinosaurs on day six. See how that works? So really, when you look at it from a biblical perspective, it all fits. And I do want to emphasize this evening that I've never been to a Bible college. I've never been to a theological seminary. All of my training as a zoologist has been in secular institutions. My major professors, vehement evolutionists and atheists. My major professor in graduate school was an atheist. He's not now because he's dead. But, um, thank you. He, <laughs> he was uh, uh, very much an outspoken atheist. And so we never got along too well because he knew that I was a Christian. I would go to church and sometimes come to work, you know, come to grad school with the Bible, and he didn't like that. But the point is this, that I have been taught evolutionary naturalism as, a undergrad, as an undergraduate in college and then as a graduate student at the university when I did my research on parasites. All I was taught, listen, all I was taught was evolutionary naturalism. So I have a real good idea of what evolutionary naturalists are, tang, are saying, the evolutionists. But this is what Scripture says. Scripture says we've been created in God's image. And it says in Acts chapter 17, look at this, and hath made of one blood all nations of men. Isn't that neat? Acts chapter 17, people have always been people. And so here in Acts chapter 17, uh, uh, Luke is telling us, hath made one blood of all nations of men. How many races are there in the world today? Um, one. <laughs> one. It's called the human race. You bet. The human race. And so some people say there's a rat race. <laughs> some of you get that. Maybe not. But anyway, uh, one race, and that's the human race. And so, again, keep this in mind. People have always been people. Dinosaurs have always been Dinosaurs, see how easy science is? Birds have always been birds. Oh, this is so simple. Okay, so uh, the philosophy of evolution says something very different than what we just read in the book of Acts, chapter 17. The philosophy of evolution says, I cannot accept what the Bible says, therefore, I will believe I came from a fish. Is that what evolution says, you came from a fish? It certainly does. Evolution says millions of years ago there was only fish in the ocean, plus the invertebrates, animals without a backbone. And that millions of years ago, fish learned, quote-unquote, how to you know, sprout feet and legs from their fins, and they crawled up on shore. And those were our evolutionary ancestors, supposedly, according to the evolutionary philosophy. And so the evolutionary philosophy says we have no room for God. Therefore, we must explain creation without a creator. We must explain creation without a creator. And here comes Charles Darwin. Anybody know what year this book was published? Every Christian should know what year this book was published. 1859. 1859. Students, in the year 1859, the Western world was turned upside down by the publication of this infamous book. Now, one thing that Darwin did not address in this book was <laughs> the origin of the species. <laughs> but that was the title of the book, The Origin of the Species. But he never got around to talking about the origin of the species. Well, Dr. Sherwin, why was this book so popular in Darwin's day? I would also add to that, why is this book so popular today in the 21st century in Washington State? Why? Because it explains creation without a creator. So in other words, this book is not scientific. No, it is not scientific. It is philosophical. And people desperately want to be told that they came from lower life forms so they will not be answerable to a holy God. 
And so that's why Darwin's book was so popular. It wasn't scientific, it's philosophical. So people have always been people. People have always been people. Okay, in 2012, evolutionists decided the human-chimpanzee split occurred between 7 and 13 million years ago. That is quite a wide variation, isn't it? 7 million years, 13 million years, I don't know, somewhere around there, <laughs> people and chimpanzees diverged. And that's not very scientific, is it? You know, a million of anything, students, is a lot, right? Shake your head like this. Yeah, a million of anything is a lot, except for dollars. And so when you have that wide variety there between 7 and 13 million years, basically, you know what the evolutionists are saying? I'm not criticizing them, but what are they saying? We don't know. Because when you have such a wide variation there, you just might as well be intellectually honest and say, we, we have no idea. And they don't. And so we find that uh, people, 100% Chelevec, and chimpanzees have always been chimpanzees. And that, look how it goes down to the bottom of the screen there. You see the bottom of the screen? That means an unknown common ancestor. Remember the prediction I made a few minutes ago? Can I make that prediction again? I predict on the basis of what the scriptures say that they will never find the common ancestor between chimpanzees, as you see there, and people. Because people were created as people, and chimpanzees were created as chimpanzees. And they do not share a common ancestor. That's why they have to say at the bottom of the screen there, it's an unknown common ancestor. We don't know the common ancestor. They will never know. They will never find the common ancestor. I know you should never say never. They will never find the common ancestor. Okay, let's, let's move on here to this quote. This, this is an amazing quote from Trends in Ecology and Evolution. As you might imagine, it's not a creationist publication. But in this publication that you see here on the right of the screen, the individuals are saying there is uncertainty about the exact timing of the human-chimpanzee divergence. Did you get that? There is uncertainty about the exact timing, and of course there is, because it goes anywhere from 7 to 13 million years. They have no idea. And they've never found the common ancestor. So I appreciate it when evolutionists say these kinds of things, as you see in the screen there. They simply don't know. I think you as students this evening should be very cognizant. You should be very aware of this because you're not going to be getting these facts from secular scientific publications in your, your high school or junior high classes. So here's the main question of which there is no answer from an evolutionary perspective. Do you see it here? How and when modern humans first emerged as a species is a major unanswered question in, here's the big word, paleoanthropology. What is paleoanthropology? It simply is looking at the rise of human beings, anthropology, the study of human beings, from, an, from a, a fossil perspective. So studying the fossil record to attempt to determine where people came from. Paleoanthropology, and then why? After that big word, paleoanthropology, why? Because the fossil record is incomplete. So you may have heard, students, that the evolution is a fact, right? Have you heard that before? I've certainly heard that a lot as an undergraduate and a graduate student. Evolution is a fact, and, and to emphasize it, they might pound the podium and pound it a little harder, okay, and that makes it a little bit more of a fact, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> and so you hear evolution's fact, evolution's a fact, and they raise their voice and they pound the podium, but the fact is that you have statements like this. They don't know how, they don't know when. It's like a police officer, the chief, coming to the police station where the police are sitting there in the day room drinking coffee. And the police chief says to the policeman, why aren't you out there at that accident? Well, chief, we didn't hear about an accident. Uh, when did this happen? I don't know, chief says, I don't know when it happened. Well, how did it happen? Well, I don't know how it happened. Just get out there. <laughs> you don't know when, you don't know how, and obviously they don't know where. 
And so that's kind of the situation, an analogy, if I could use that word, when it comes to uh, the rise of humans from some ape-like ancestor. It never happened. But I like to use this quote from the source of ultimate information in the world today, Wikipedia. <laughs> now, I usually don't quote from Wikipedia because it's not a true blue scientific publication, but it is. The articles are written by scientists, by and large. I couldn't get away from using this quote and sharing it with you this evening from Wikipedia. And let me add this, Wikipedia is very anti-Christian. They are not on our side, and they are very pro-evolution. Uh, they, they, um, they accuse creationists of being unscientific, basically, in Wikipedia. And they said, the age of the, what is that, MRCA? What is, suppose that MRCA is? So it's very important when we talk about human evolution because the MRCA means most recent common ancestor. Oh, wait a minute, we talked about common ancestors, didn't we? Didn't I make two predictions about common ancestor? Which is what? Never find them. You will never find those common ancestors. And so here, Wikipedia is saying the age of the most recent common ancestor of all living humans is unknown. And it will always be unknown. Could I repeat that? It will always be unknown. They will never find that most recent common ancestor. So, fossils do not support human evolution. We can say that without hesitation this evening. Fossils do not support human evolution. Wait a minute, Dr. Sherwin. I was taught about Lucy. You remember the genus species name of Lucy? Australopithecus afarensis. Too late in the evening to be talking like this. <laughs> but Australopithecus afarensis, otherwise known as Lucy, discovered in 1974, was supposedly one of the key scientific finds that would link people with chimpanzees. Lucy, Australopithecus. Well, after all the brouhaha died down, all the hubbub, all the celebration and the popping of corks and the pouring of champagne, we found a missing link. Hooray! <laughs> Then reality set in, and they began to investigate the remains of Lucy, which were, which were pretty good. They were pretty good remains. It wasn't even 50% of, the, of the, um, the fossils, but they found a goodly part of it. They found out, wait a minute, Lucy had ape-like arms. Lucy had ape-like fingers. In Texas, we call these fingers. <laughs> Lucy had ape-like legs. She had an ape-like skull. Everything about Lucy was ape-like. Well, Dr. Sherwin, then why all the celebration? Why did they go to all the trouble to celebrate and put Lucy in taxpayer-paid public school biology textbooks if she was ape, and she was ape, an extinct ape? The reason is because they started looking at the pelvic girdle, the pelvis. We, we can see the pelvis of this dinosaur here. We have a pelvis, okay? And the pelvis of Lucy looked like she might have been able to walk upright. Well, as we say in Texas, big deal. Because if you go to the San Diego Zoo, I've been to San Diego Zoo dozens of times. If you go to the San Diego Zoo, you will find the living pygmy chimpanzee. The living pygmy chimpanzee. And sure enough, you will find approximately 10% of the time the living pygmy chimpanzee, the San Diego Zoo, will walk upright. Now, you can tell she doesn't like to, but she can. She can walk upright. So what does that say to us today? All right, maybe Lucy did walk upright. Do we know that she habitually walked upright? No, because all we have is the fossils, and it's an incomplete fossil of Lucy. So there's a, a, some things we know about Lucy, but not a whole lot of things. And so what we see is that if there are chimpanzees that walk upright today, and they're 100% chimpanzee, and if we look at the residual fossils of Lucy and find everything about Lucy was what? Ape-like. Well, what's, what's the big deal? What they have discovered is 
an extinct ape, and that's what Lucy was. However, the fossil record of early life is extremely fragmented, and its quality significantly deteriorates further back in time. This is talking about life in general, fossilized life in general in the fossil record. But getting more specifically, and you see the second quote there by Moffat uh, two short years ago, he says, unfortunately, we only have limited fossils to work with. And so, new specimens and sites can quickly change our understanding of human evolution. So these are quotes that I like to see. And I, again, I salute the evolutionist who puts this in print so that we can read it and understand that this idea of human evolution is seriously, seriously flawed. And that evolution of human beings is anything but a solid fact. And so, again, unfortunately, we have only limited fossils uh, to work with, and so new specimens and sites can quickly change our understanding of human evolution. And so these are quotes that we would like to see put in American taxpayer-paid public school textbooks, specifically in the section on human evolution. Wouldn't that be a breath of fresh air? Wouldn't that be a balance of this uh, issue between creation science and evolution? If the public school student could read quotes from fellow evolutionists who are not Christians, who do not quote the Bible, but they're saying things such as you see here, that'd be wonderful to, to see something like that. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, the fossil evidence for human evolution is patchy. I don't know what the word patchy in Russian is, but it just means brief, not real, not real solid. There has been a great deal of controversy over primate and human relationships. This was said by Benton out of England in a very popular evolutionary textbook. It's, it's called Vertebrate Paleontology. I've worn out, I've had this textbook now for six years and I've worn out. That cover's all messed up and everything else. I have completely read through that book at least twice. And I get quotes like this out of an evolutionary textbook. So I appreciate Benton saying what he said here. There has been a great deal of controversy uh, over primate and human relationships. And then two years later, we read in 2017, look at this, at the American Museum of Natural History, there has never been a more secular uh, display anywhere in the world than the American Museum of Natural History. They said because fossils are so scarce, Researchers do not know what the last common ancestors of living apes and humans look like or where they originated. When did they say that? What's that, about three years ago? This is a, a very, very important information. And once again, it would be nice to take this quote and put it in American taxpayer-paid public biology textbook for the public school there. And so, no common ancestor. That's the take-home point this evening. Where are the common ancestors that would link us, Homo sapiens, with chimpanzees? Pan paniscus, which is the genus species name. We just don't have them. And we never will have them, according to the creation science model. Well, in the past 15 years, have called into question every assumption about who we are and where we came from. Turns out our evolution is more baffling than we thought. And so this comes from a 2017 publication called uh, 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 New Scientist Magazine. New Scientist Magazine, it is completely secular in its worldview. And to have the authors admit in the past 15 years Every assumption has been called into question, who we are, where we came from. Evolution is more baffling than we thought. Wow! Three, what is that, three years ago? That is an amazing, amazing admission to make. And it's a breath of fresh air. So don't be intimidated. I say this over and over again, but don't be intimidated when you were taught that human evolution is a fact. Not when we have statements being made like this by secular individuals who are not Christians, not creationists. 
So when you look at the narrative for hominid origins, hominin, just that group of, of uh, people and, and apes like the chimpanzees, the narrative of hominin origins, it's just a big mess. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And look at the date there. That was said way, way back in the year 2021. Okay. So, again, if you leave here tonight, just think about the fact that as of this year, this year, human evolution is just a big mess. And this is, again, at the American Museum of Natural History. And so the fossils really don't support human evolution at all. It's just a big mess. A great quote from the American Museum of Natural History. Okay, how about the evolution of languages? Let me tell you something about languages. The ancient languages in the Middle East and the Far East, those ancient languages were very, very sophisticated, very detailed. The grammar, the syntax, nothing simple about it. It was a beautiful, beautiful language groups that they had back then, you know, centuries and centuries ago. Today, we have English. And, you know, we are surprised we look at each other and we can understand each other <laughs> because the English is so clunky. And that's why I like to study Russian. Ruski yazik, okay? I, uh, ya lublu ruski yazik, <laughs> if, if you understand that. But anyway, um, uh, so what about the evolution of language? Is there any indication at all as to where languages came from? The evolutionists, because they dismiss the Bible, they ignore the Bible, they have to say that people learned how to speak from the barks and the grunts of animals. Let me say that again. Evolutionists reject the Bible, and so they say when it comes to language, that we had had to have learned how to speak through barks and grunts of, of, of animals there. But there is no indication of that whatsoever. The capacity for language is built upon our ability to understand combinations of words and the relationships between them. Look at this. But the evolutionary history of this ability is little understood. When was that said? 2020, last year. Last year, they said, little understood. Of course it's little understood. If you are outside of the Bible, you will never understand the acquisition of languages because languages are God-given. And so they, um, the evolutionary history of this ability is little understood. I like that. It is unknown. It's not as little understood. They have no idea. They're clueless. They don't know where language came from. Little understood. Yeah. Okay, so what is the key war, uh, tool used in human evolution studies? Anybody want to get, it's just us here tonight. What's a key tool used in human evolution studies? The answer is imagination. Imagination is the key word, uh, key thing that is used in the study of human evolution. And I can prove it to you by somebody named, let's see, maybe you've heard his name before, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin said, look at this, he said that one's ability, one's, excuse me, he said one's imagination must fill in the very wide blanks. Is that right? Charles Darwin, the founder of, the, uh, the founder of evolutionary theory in 1859, he said one's imagination must fill in the very wide blanks. And so that's, uh, it started with Darwin, and it's been going full steam ahead ever since. But, as it says here, that's not science. So if somebody says, well, I used my imagination to solve this problem, <laughs> don't think that's scientific. <laughs> it's not. That's not science. So this is, uh, an, uh, again, a quote from a leading paleontologist. What's a paleontologist class? Somebody who studies Fossils. Good. You got it. Somebody who studies fossils. And this comes from an individual, Peter Dodson. Peter Dodson is an evolutionary naturalist. He likes to study, um, what is it, triceratops. Have you seen the triceratops here? That's what he likes to study. So he's a paleontologist. He's a full-blown evolutionist. He says, I have to tell you that imagination, right there, imagination is a very, very 
ochen ochen important trait for those who study fossils. What? Well, that's not science. I'm not laughing at them or criticizing them. I'm simply saying it's not scientific. Okay, they accuse us as being, being unscientific because we believe in the beginning God, but then they say, well, you have to use imagination, and it's very, very important. But what's a dictionary definition of, of <laughs> imagination? According to Webster's dictionary, uh, 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 New World Dictionary, imagination is the act or power of forming mental images of what is not present. <laughs> So don't think that using your imagination is a scientific uh, process. It is not. So the story of human evolution is complex. Again, going back to this secular publication called New Scientist. And according to New Scientist, they say the story of human evolution is complex. I would agree. Ganeshna, of course, it is a story. It's nothing but a story. And uh, it's a story of which there is no fossil evidence. And so this linear progression of uh, ape-like creature to a full-blown human being there at the edge of the screen there, uh, we don't find those missing links. Did I mention this uh, this evening? The missing links are missing. <laughs> Please write that down. The missing links are missing. Just like the common ancestor is missing. You never find that common ancestor. And so then the fossil record does not support this idea of human evolution. So let's look at some stories when it comes to human evolution. It's important. Have you ever heard of fake news? We've heard of fake news, right? How about urban legends? Have you ever heard of urban legends? So we have a lot of our urban legends and fake news out there, and, and thanks to the internet, <laughs> thanks to talk tick. What's a talk tick, tick tock? One of those. Okay, I can never keep track of it. <laughs> and so let's look at some of these uh, urban legends there. Uh, how about chiropractics? You know, when they, they work on you back, your back, and they say the reason why we're making millions and millions and millions of dollars every year is because human beings have only recently learned how to walk upright. And because humans have only recently learned how to walk upright, Therefore, we have all sorts of back problems because this acquisition of upright walking is relatively recent in the evolutionary story, the evolutionary scenario. And it sound, um, sounds compelling, sounds convincing, and I was intimidated about that for years and years until science came along and kind of answered the question. See, why we are wrecking our backs. This is an article written, why we are wrecking our backs. This comes from NBC News. Is NBC News a friend of creationist? No. <laughs> NBC News hates creationists, okay? All the networks do. But they said heavy backpacks or bags can lead to back problems and poor posture. But then look at this quote from Newport Orthopedic Institute just a few years ago. Look what they said. About 5,000 children visit emergency rooms each year because of backpack-related injuries. That is amazing. Okay. And so really think about it. When uh, you put on that backpack and you spend all day with a very, very heavy backpack and your back, your bones are still developing, uh, that can cause problems. And folks, that has nothing to do with evolution. That has got zero to do with evolution and everything to do with posture, just like this poor Maliki Mulchik. Well, nothing to do with Darwinian evolution. So what's the cause of back problems? Well, obesity, no exercise, bad habits, injury, all of that can contribute to back injuries. And so one of the things that we can start doing is to pull your shoulders back and walk upright. Don't slouch. And so if anything else, that's a good reason to be in the military for four years or so because they teach you how to walk, how to march, stand upright, keep your shoulders back and all. And it's amazing how you, some of your back problems will disappear. Also, you know, watch your, your weight and exercise. All of these things are so basic, so fundamental. But again, it has nothing to do with evolution. So is the evolution of bipedalism? What is bipedalism? 
By means two, right? Two feet. Is the evolution of two foot, two feet, upright walking, the cause of our back problems? And the answer is not at all. Exactly why and when our ancestors stood upright and started moving around on two feet is still shrouded in what, class? Mystery. It's still shrouded in mystery. They don't know why, according to the theory of evolution, people first started to walk upright. And according to what Scripture says, people have always been people, so we have always walked upright. We didn't come up from the apes and learned how to stand upright and get around because people have always been people. It's shrouded in mystery according to evolution. Here's another quote from Peter Raven's book on biology. It's a university biology text. The origin of bipedalism, that is two feet walking, the key event in the evolution of hominids remains, oh, he used the same word there. It's a mystery. It will always be a mystery. People were created as people. We have always walked upright. So, uh, again, people have always been people. Upright walking is, is unique to the hominids, which includes people. Well, I don't know what the Russian word for appendix is, okay? That little bit of tissue there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But anyway, our body does not contain useless structures. Have you ever heard about that? Your tonsils? Maybe you had your tonsils taken out. Um, I grew up in, I hate to tell you this, I grew up in the 1950s. I am so old. And a lot of my friends got their tonsils taken out because the doctors trained back in the 1950s were told by their evolutionary colleagues and instructors that our tonsils were a useless evolutionary vestige, something our ancient evolutionary ancestors had, but that we don't need anymore. So if somebody got uh, infected tonsils and all that, guess what? The, t the surgeon would go in there and clip out the tonsils. Oops, bad call, bad science, because it's based on evolution. Now we find out in the 21st century that our tonsils is very important lymphatic tissue. Think about it, when you inhale, you inhale pathogens, which are disease-causing organisms like bacteria and viruses, fungal spores, and one of the first lines of defense is something called lymphatic tissue. Guess what your tonsils are? Lymphatic tissue. <laughs> Oops, but I got my tonsils cut out. Now, sometimes, sometimes, very, very rarely, people will need to have their tonsils taken out because the tonsils get infected, in medicine, they call it a nidus of infection. That means a source of infection. The bacteria get in there, and they proliferate in this lymphatic tissue. The tonsils uh, expand, and what happens? It occludes the airway. Occludes means blocks the airway. And I hate it when that happens. Thank you. And so a surgeon will have to go in there and cut out the tonsils so the person can breathe. I mean, what do you want? Do you want tonsils, or do you want to breathe? You know, I'll, I'll take breathing. So very rarely, very rarely, those tonsils have to be cut out because they, they expand and, and block the airway there. And so God doesn't make any junk. You can quote me on that. God does not make any junk. And so those, your tonsils are not uh, uh, junk there at all. And uh, so all tissues and organs have a function. All organs, all tissues in our body has a function given to us by God just thousands of years ago. Well, this uh, tonsils are an evidence of creation. Having tonsils removed more than triples the risk of developing asthma in later life, a new study suggests. The first long-term investigation into consequences of the common childhood procedure also found increased risk of, look at this, influenza, pneumonia, as well as chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And that was said in 2018. So keep your tonsils. Keep your appendix if you can. Now, sometimes the appendix, uh, your appendix is called the veriform appendix. Vermes is a Latin word for worm. And so your appendix is about the size of your little finger. And so the appendix is about that size, and it's only provided by one artery. 
So one artery going into the appendix is all that supplies it with blood. If that one artery gets occluded, if it gets blocked, then all of that tonsil becomes just rotting tissue, and people get an appendicitis. See how easy it is? They get an appendicitis because they have this rotting tissue that used to be a nice, healthy, pink appendix that's dead. And so a surgeon has to get in there and take out the appendix before it explodes and then causes a generalized uh, infection. But, and, and so that's true. Sometimes the, the uh, artery for the appendix does get occluded, but it, um, it doesn't mean that you should get your appendix taken out because your appendix is made of lymphatic tissue as well, tissue that helps to program white blood cells called lymphocytes. Maybe you've heard of lymphocytes, white blood cells. And so it's very important for your appendix and for your tonsils, and um, keep them if you can, <laughs> okay? Have you ever heard of this urban legend, this, uh, uh, what do they call, fake news, that 98.4% of our DNA is the same as a chimpanzee? Wow, 98.4% of our DNA is the same as a chimpanzee? No, that's, that's fake news, that's an urban legend. Uh, that has no, um, that's an evolutionary story, okay? Uh, for example, 50% of our DNA is the same as a banana, okay? So a banana and people have 50% the same DNA, and I want to emphasize that because it comes from Robert May, a chief uh, UK scientist, uh, and it was quoted in New Scientist magazine, volume 167, okay? So, <laughs> so is that banana you had this morning, is that one half human? Okay, <laughs> and you know, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, so yeah, bananas have, and people have 50% the same DNA, but that has nothing to do with evolution. And so people in chimpanzees drink the same water, they breathe the same air, they eat the same food, so obviously, uh, students, most of their DNA would be the same, right? Yeah. So if they drink the same water, breathe the same air, eat the same food, that means their genes, a significant portion of their genome, their genetic makeup, would have to be exactly the same. Exactly the same. But it doesn't stop there because rats and mice <laughs> also breathe the same air, drink the same water, eat the same food. So all of a sudden now, rats and mice have a lot of their genome that's the same as people. But what about a blue whale? Yeah. Blue whales and people DNA, much of it is the same too. Because they eat the same food, kind of gross, krill, kind of oily, isn't it? Breathe the same air, they're air breathers, aren't they? And they, they drink uh, subtle amounts of seawater as well. And there's unique physiology in that that I won't get into. But the point is this, that it doesn't mean a common ancestor. Remember what I said about common ancestors? What did I say? They'll never be found, exactly. They will never be found. So all of this DNA that's the same in the animals I just mentioned and people doesn't mean a common ancestor. What does it mean? It means a common designer. It means a common designer. And so we have a common designer. And so if I want to uh, 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 metabolize and break down and digest protein, then I have the enzymes to do that. But whales also eat uh, uh, protein, and they have exactly the same enzymes, which means exactly the same DNA. See how that works? Same thing with carbohydrates like sugars and fats, of course, too, like triglycerides and so forth. So this is a good quote. I want to share this with you very quickly as we come to an end, and we're out of time. For about 23% of our genome, we share no immediate genetic ancestry with our closest living relative, the chimpanzee. There you have it, from an evolutionary publication. Did you see what they said? 23% of our genome, that's almost one quarter of our genome, we share no immediate genetic ancestries with the chimpanzee. Now, the evolutionists uh, who said this are secular. They believe we came from the chimpanzee, but they're being intellectually honest. I salute them by saying that one quarter of, their DNA, of our DNA is different from a chimpanzee. That translates to a whole lot of genes that are not the same at all as a chimpanzee. Well, as I say, we're out of time, but I'll just leave you with this little bit here. 
uh, human saliva in chimpanzee saliva. You would think, since you supposedly we are of such close ancestry, evolutionarily speaking, that our saliva would be the same. Are they the same? Absolutely not. So this is a diagram from a, a paper that I read about that showing humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and macaques. And you can see by the lines there, they are very, very different. If humans and chimpanzees had the same saliva, the, the chimpanzees supposedly are our closest evolutionary ancestor, then that black line right above the word chimpanzees should be down where the human line is, but it's not because the two are very different. We found that humans produce a watery saliva containing less than half the total protein than great apes and old world monkeys. And they said that just two short years ago. And so even when you look at the saliva, we are quite different. By the way, human saliva is 99.5% water. We discovered unique protein profiles in saliva of humans that were distinct from those of non-human primates. And again, this is a secular author. This is an author that thoroughly believes that we came from chimpanzees or the chimpanzees are our, in our evolutionary ancestry, and they are admitting that they are quite, quite different, just exactly what creationists would predict.